on that note, I think we're going to get started, unless anyone has any objections. We're starting with chapter 5. Let me put the link out there. If you want to check out the author and her work, by all means, please do. <clears throat> and then there's Redthorn. Hello, Redthorn. I would just like to say hi, he says. Hello, Redthorn. Your high has been documented. I appreciate it. But Mama's Mama's ready. Fantastic. All right, we're on page 41, chapter 5 of Pomegranate Tears. <laughs> the record shows, indeed. This chapter is simply titled 1957. So here we go. The boiling August sun bore down on me, its beams on full blast, and I breathed f liquid fire. Why was it so hot this year? I love the heat, but not this much. In the middle of the afternoon, the streets were empty, the village asleep, everyone having their siesta, everyone apart from Anna and me. We only had the daylight to work in and had to make the most of it. Despite the shade in the narrow alleyway behind our house, heat still lingered, trapping us in a sauna. My loose dress clung to my back and under my armpits. I tried to ignore the sweat trickling down my neck and between my breasts. A stray hair slid out from behind my ear, and it, I curled it back from wiping the perspiration from the back of my neck with my left hand. If I used my right one, I wouldn't be able to hold my needle to sew. I'm fed up of embroidering. Anna threw the white cotton sheet she was working on to a nearby chair. I looked up and relaxed my eyes. They stung from both the heat and the continuous concentration needed to embroider the tiny stitches which made up the top border of the matrimonial sheet. Anna's feet soaked in a basin of cool water. She said it stopped her hands from sweating and sticking to the needle. For me, it made no difference. My hands still clung to the material. I reached for the glass bottle of water kept out of the sun under my straw chair and popped open the plastic top. Mama had added slices of lemon to quench her thirst. I took long, deep mouthfuls. No matter how much I drank, thirst still gnawed at me. Day, nothing relieved the dryness in my mouth. The hot rays penetrated the concrete ground, sending up a suffocating fuzziness, heating the water for Anna's feet through the tin basin, and in a moment of fury, she kicked the pan across the pavement with unrestrained violence. The loud clang broke the calm, so out of the place in the sleepy afternoon. It woke the neighbor's cat, who'd been lazing in the shade of a sparse shrub. With a loud yelp, it scapered out of sight over a low stone wall. My eyes widened. What's come over you? Anna was the spitting image of a madwoman. A wild scraggle of hair stuck up where she'd raked her hand through her short, sweaty curls time and time again. Red, blotchy eyes against her crimson complexion stared back at me. Had she been in the sun too long? I can't take it anymore. Anna's voice came out in a whimper. I wiped my palm over the top of the bottle and handed it to her. Take a drink. Anna managed to smile, which didn't quite reach her eyes. She took the bottle and emptied it in a few long gulps. Better? I asked. She leaned back in the chair and hitched her long, flowered skirt high above her knees. We need to get out of this dump. There's no future for us here. A flush of adrenaline tingled my body. What do you suggest? I asked. 
She thrust a hand into the deep pocket of her skirt and pulled out a newspaper clipping. It had been folded and unfolded so many times, the crease lines were all fluffy. I gazed from the frail paper to Anna's face. It's an advert for jobs in England, she said, wiping her brow with the back of her hand. And? Ornella is already interested. So why don't the three of us go? Who's Ornella? I asked. She's one of my neighbors. I bit the inside of my cheek. Was Anna serious? A slight heaviness quivered in the pit of my stomach. Would my designs finally leap off the page and into boutiques? Could this be the way out I was looking for? What kind of jobs are on offer? Designing? Dressmaking? France is where the fashion houses are. Let's go to France instead. We both speak the language well. Anna shook her head. There aren't any ads for France. Besides, what's wrong with a bit of adventure? We need something to spice up our lives. We don't speak English. We'll learn. I pressed my lips together. Could we do this? Was I ready to leave home? Although I moaned and moaned, I managed to cope with things. And I'd miss Mama. Not to mention Luca. Anna let out a deep sigh and put away her cottons while I stood to fold my embroidered sheet. Boredom kills, Bianca. And you know that. She was right. Yet, I hesitated to go along with her plans. Leaving Italy is a big step, especially for you, I said, hoping she wouldn't be offended. You've never been further than Foscoli, and that's only six kilometers away. Well then, now's the time to travel. A movement to the right caught my attention, and Anna's cousin, Paolo, who had been eyeing me for the past few weeks, appeared at the end of the alleyway. Anna followed my look, and her cheeks dimpled. I don't think Paolo's come for me. My face heated up. You've gone bright red, Anna said, and don't tell me it's the sun, and because it's not. I glared at her before turning my gaze to Paolo. You two working hard? Vittorio's gruff voice came from behind me. Merda. If my brother saw Paolo lurking at the end of the alleyway, he'd put two and two together and come up with five, as always. Another excuse to show his authority over me. Anna didn't answer and packed her things. I caught the slight tremble in her hands. Thank you, Soda. I appreciate you being here. Have a great day at work. Vittorio glared at Paolo, who turned on his heels and darted back down the alleyway. No need for words. My brother's face said it all. Anyone who didn't want trouble needed to keep out of his way. In one long stride, he stood in front of me and welcomed me with such a slap it sent my head ringing. I staggered back, eyes watering. Why did he have to be like this? What right did he have to boss me around? Before I had the chance to retaliate, Vittorio's rough hands latched onto my arms. I tried to break free, but they pushed me to the ground before catching my hair. They wrenched the skin of my scalp so taut I was sure I'd pass out. Adrenaline coursed through me, and I brought my elbow up to jab him in the groin. He didn't think his sister would react like this, and it made him angrier. Big mistake on my part. He twisted my hair around his hand for a better grip and pulled me to my feet. My eyes watered as I attempted to get away, but he was strong. After a few more moments of struggling, I gave up. 
No point in stirring up his anger. He'd only get more violent, and I'd get the bitter end of his rage. Snorting like a wild animal, chest and arm muscles bulging, he turned to Anna. Say goodbye to Bianca. She's needed in the house. Anna's eyes probably reflected the same fright as in my own, yet she managed to answer in a squeaky voice. I'll see you tomorrow, Bianca. With both hands on my head in an attempt to keep my scalp on, I turned to her and mouthed, We are going to England, before Vittorio dragged me back to the house. I tried to keep in step with him, and now that he'd won this battle, he'd loosened his grip a little. Despite the pain and stumbling up the steps into our house, my lips curled up into a secretive smile. My abusive brother had just helped me onto the train for England. In exactly six months, I'd blow out my 21 candles, and I'd be out of his life. Okay, there's a small break in the story. Time has moved on, perspective has moved on. I turned onto my back and gazed up into the dark. My body refused to relax. It was stifling hot without even a hint of a breeze. No air drifted in through the open French windows. The net curtains remained morbidly still. After a few minutes, I swung both legs out of bed and slipped into my shoes. I needed a cool drink. That bottle of sparking gososa in the fridge would quench my thirst. Careful not to wake Florinda, I eased open the bedroom door. Her gentle snoring confirmed her deep slumber. Downstairs, the sleepy cat greeted me. I headed for the fridge and pulled out a bottle of water. Its cool touch raised the hairs on my arm. I downed the contents in long gulps before setting the empty bottle onto the table, then stroked the cat zigzagging around my legs for a few minutes before returning to my room. The clock in the piazza struck midnight, then one. I tossed back the thin sheet and tiptoed barefoot to the window where I ventured out onto the balcony, pulling my hair away from my damp neck. The muggy heat made me irritable. Somewhere in the distance, an owl called into the night, breaking the eerie silence. Movement from the right caught my attention. Searching the obscurity, I glimpsed the glow of a cigarette on the other side of the piazza. Stepping back into the bedroom, I slid into the darkness. But from behind the net of curtains, I had a clear view. My breath caught in my throat. Vittario had a way of moving that could only be him. That confident roll of the shoulders movement. This wasn't the first time I'd seen him wandering in the dark. My brother had become a predator of the night. His silhouette melted perfectly with the shadows. At times, I didn't even notice him, yet he never missed a single move of mine. Where did he go all the time? And why so late at night? We all knew he was a loner. No one to share his feelings or thoughts, and preferring his own company to that of others. Only this time, he wasn't alone. A woman glided out from the darkness and slid her hands around his body. Two silhouettes became one as their lips joined. No doubt a langorious kiss. I stepped out onto the balcony again and let out a low whistle, determined to let Vittorio know I'd seen him. He broke off his long embrace and shoved the woman behind him. She hurried down the dimly lit passageway, her heels clicking on the cobblestones. For someone meeting in secret, she should have worn flatties. Would have been more discreet. My brother stepped out from the shadows and marched up to the house. His face creased like he'd sucked a lemon. Good. I remained, hands on hips, for a moment longer before turning on my heels and going back inside. Uh -huh. 
small break in the story. But it looks like now she's got something on him. Morning, Bianca. Vittorio's voice cut my prayers off in mid-flow. I stopped mumbling out, raised my eyes to the ceiling. Now what? He entered my bedroom and came to stand in front of me. Had the problem sleeping last night? I made the sign of the cross and stood. Just like you, it appeared. A muscle twitched at the corner of his mouth. Touché. I turned to leave, but he grabbed my arm. You did not see anything last night, did you? His smile. He smiled to soften the words. Let go of my arm now, or I'll tell Papa. And as I didn't see anything, as you say, I might have to make things up. He released my arm, and a smile, and I smiled deep inside. This was the first time worry etched his features. Don't get smart, Bianca. It doesn't suit you. Is that so? And what does suit me? Being bullied by you? Saying amen to everything you tell me to do? His mouth twitched. Get out of here before I... Before you what? My voice came out in a jeering whisper. I refused to let him Im intimidate me any longer. He held my gaze, chin high, nostrils flaring, and I stormed out of the bedroom. I'm not my sister, I yelled over my shoulder. I made it halfway down the corridor before my father's voice bellowed up the stairs. Vittorio. Oops. Not a good sign. I risked a peek over my shoulder. My brother's face had drained of all color. When Papa shouted, hell would be let loose. Swearing under his breath, Vittorio pushed past me and pranced down the stairs as if he hadn't a care in the world. What a great actor. He didn't appear in the least bit perturbed. From the top of the stairs, I had a clear view of the kitchen. A noise from behind me captured my attention. Florinda had come out of the bedroom. Before she could utter a word, I brought my finger to my lips. She stared wide-eyed and sat at the top step with me. What is it? She whispered. I don't know. Papa shouted for Vittorio. Doesn't look good. We grasped the last part of the conversation. The first few minutes had been loud whisperings and swear words. But this conversation had something to do with me? When my father raised his voice, I caught the gist of the problem. I don't want you sniffing around her anymore. Understood? Long silence set in. I said, do I make myself clear? Yes, Papa. Good. My father's temper evaporated as quickly as it arrived. I winked at my sister. Someone had split on Vittorio. And from... Yes. And from all the commotion, this girl wasn't to Papa's liking. Not a girl fit for his son. You're talking about Sylvia, Florinda said. I stared wide-eyed. How do you know? Sylvia's sister told me. She said Sylvia and Vittorio were hanging out together. And they're a lot more than simple friends, if you know what I mean. I swallowed hard. That must have been the girl I'd seen Vittorio with last night. Did this mean he had a serious girlfriend? I rubbed my hand across my chin. Vittorio was keeping his relationship a secret because he knew Papa wouldn't approve. Not surprising. Who would let their daughter run around at night, fooling about with the boys? Quick! 
Lorinda hissed, pulling my arm. Here he comes! <clears throat> I scrambled to my feet, but stumbled on the top step. Lorinda scurried out of sight, leaving me rubbing my sore knee. Ever so slowly, I peered over my shoulder and found him glaring at me from the bottom of the stairs. A smug grin plastered on his face. Before I knew it, he'd taken the steps two by two and rushed up to me. With his body pushed up close to mine, he breathed his anger into my face. I stood firm. Retreating would be a sign of weakness and give the, en give the enemy satisfaction. Holding onto my mask of defiance, I tried not to betray my fear. My father appeared at the bottom of the stairs. What's going on? After a few moments, Vittorio replied through his teeth. Nothing, Papa. With a shove of the shoulder, he pushed past me and disappeared down the corridor. His bedroom door slammed shut, and I was left staring at my father, a satisfied grin on my face.